Thank you, thank you very much. Can you hear me in the back? Everybody can hear me in the back? Perfect, A plus. The question is, what's the difference between a resin cement and a flowable composite? In many cases, uh, there is very little difference between a resin cement and a flowable composite. But let's divide that into two types of cements. One is a veneer cement. The original flowables were actually uh, light cures, uh, light cure only veneer cements. And uh, the uh, flowables today are far better, but essentially uh, that was their origin. A resin cement, especially a one-step resin cement, is a dual cure. Most flowables are light cure. Most uh, resin cements are dual cure. So that's the uh, basic difference in terms of flowability. Uh, different companies have different levels, so that's really not that much of an issue. There's a major range of fillers in both cements and in, uh, and in flowables. So you have a whole variety to choose from. And you can choose whatever you're more comfortable with. Generally, a filled resin cement is better than an unfilled resin cement. Uh, but it depends what works in your hands and what has the right color uh, and flow characteristics for your practice. And I think he summed it up. You have light cured versus uh, dual cure or even sometimes self cure. And depending on the material, for instance, you cannot light cure through zirconia. Uh, even though it, it looks really nice and white, it's not, you're not going to get through it. So in that case, you want truly a self-cure material, even though the viscosity and the flowability may feel exactly the same. Uh, some of the more translucent materials, like the lucite reinforced, and even lithium disilicate, a little bit of light will get through it, so you're probably going to want to choose something that, that's maybe dual cure. And for veneers, for example, you don't really need, and when you don't want a self-curing material because it's not as color stable as a, a regular uh, bonding or, or a uh, adhesive cement that we would do for porcelain veneers where we can tack in place and then finally get a complete light cure because the light will actually go through the veneer. If you're trying to mask something and you have an opaque veneer, well then it's a problem because you're not going to use a light cured cement on a veneer you're trying to opaque something out because it's never going to cure on you as well. And then you have to go with the dual cure which is a little bit more color stable than something that's not a, uh, d totally dependent on self-cure. And also the margins. When you're looking at the margins five, ten years from now, are you going to see a little bit of that little creep, a little bit of that blackness or stain building up because it's exposed to the environment where the core of the body of the veneer or the crown isn't. And once in a while a, a porcelain po fused to metal fracture will occur in my practice and I just don't have the luxury of doing that crown over. You know, it'd be the, the age, finances, I may not have made that crown. I may have inherited that patient and I don't feel comfortable not billing a patient for a crown and they're going to have to pay for it and they can't afford it. Michael was lucky enough when, uh, when we first put together this program to have a bunch of patients walk into his practice and he's a very creative guy. So what we have is we have on this, this central, we've got an older repair that was chipped compared to a new repair that we're doing today that you can see on the, on the lateral. So on tooth number seven, we've got an incisal edge fracture with a little pinpoint exposure of the metal that if we didn't mask out and we didn't tribochemically treat, would literally look like a dark spot or a gray shadow throughout the tooth. A lot of times we can get a central edge fracture. Now this is typically where if you're comfortable with hydrofluoric acid, getting back to your question, you can literally take a diamond burr and what I would do is, and, and Mike did it his way and I'll tell you, I would probably do it a little bit different. I would prepare this more like a veneer than I would just to bevel it in. I'm going to carry my finish line in a proximal where I can hide it. I'm going to bring my composite and blend it in. Mike just sort of beveled it in so it's it sort of blended in a little bit. You can hydrofluorically acid etch this. Then you can take, because it's all porcelain, there's no metal exposed, you can take your silane coupling agent and then treat it like a veneer and do a composite repair. If you're not comfortable with hydrofluoric acid in the mouth, then you can try biochemically treat it because you're getting two advantages. You're micro etching it, so you're getting extra surface area, and then you're taking a nail gun and you're embedding silicate particles into some of those areas and getting some mechanical retention, and now you have something you can silenate and actually bond to. So now we have that, and we're going to go to this repair. So on the left you have the fracture, on the right you have the repair. This is Michael's work, and I appreciate his help. I would literally, like I said, feather it in and bring it a little bit more in a proximal because I found clinically over time that's the area that doesn't really show in shadow and you can't perceive that. So we have the before of that incisal edge repair on the left. We've got the old ceramic repair in the middle, and then we've got the post-op on the, on the right, the final repair on the right. Everyday stuff. I mean, you may not say I'm going to do porcelain fused to metal fractures. It's not practical for my practice. Yet we all have had patients come in we try to tap the crown off, we refer the patient to an endodontist, and now they put a nice big hole on this beautiful crown that they just paid for. 
Well, it's a problem. It's an issue in practice. We're always going to, what are you going to do? You're going to plug it with amalgam? Patient's going to come back three weeks later saying, you never told me I've got to have a black spot in my tooth. So now what we have is we have an endo access. We're fortunate in this case that there was enough occlusal reduction, so we've got the metal, which is a good half millimeter below the porcelain, so that we have the ability to tribochemically treat this, and now we can use some of the opaquers that come in the Siljet kit. So what we have is I showed you the micro etcher, but in the Siljet kit, and Kojet's uh, kit is very similar to that, what you have is you have a small bottle that literally unscrews and fits right on your micro etcher. After that, what you have is it comes with your silane coupler, it comes with your bonding liquid, and what's really missing from every other kit is a really good opaquer. So you've got two shades of opaquer that you can literally take a, a uh, explorer or you can take a micro brush and apply to that exposed metal that you just cryochemically treated, and now you can mask it out and chemically bond to that to get the results that you see on the right-hand side. Mike's a little bit creative in the sense that it's a metal surface, a fractured parcel. If you've got resin teeth, if you've got some ceramic teeth that are literally attached to a Vitalian partial, in theory, you can tribochemically treat this. This is something that was sent to me about a week or two ago, so I can't show you what this is going to look like six months from now, and I'm hoping we have a follow-up to something like that. Once again, when you tribochemically treat something, you're literally quadrupling that retentive. Now you have something to get that monoblock feature, which was the missing element that we had before. Once again, we have the, the difference between when you just, just sandblast it versus you, you, you tribochemically treat it. You're taking a crystalline surface, and now you're, you're etching it, in a sense, with the micro-etcher by roughening it up, but you're nailing these silicate particles inside that we can silenate and bond to. And we've got the studies, once again, showing that it really does make this. How do you do it? You literally take your micro-etcher that you see right here, fill it up, you unscrew the jar, replace this, the, uh, the jar with the, the, uh, sil the siljet, the powder comes out of it, you blast the surface, you rinse it, you dry it. After you've dried the material, you take your silane bonding coupling agent, your, your S-bond or whatever material you're comfortable with, you apply it to that surface, leave it on there for a minute, you dry it, and then you treat it like a composite repair, like someone fractured off the incisal edge. And now we have opaquers. We've got acrylate OP, meaning opaquer in two different shades that will truly mask out the metal that's exposed. So now you can literally treat it as if you've, uh, you've taken the opaquer and put it on that porcelain fused to metal crown that just came out of the oven. For zirconia, for aluminum crowns, what you have now is you're going to treat the tooth like a normal tooth. You're going to use whatever bonding agent that you're comfortable with that the, that the, the, uh, the uh, resin cement manufacturer recommends. The only different step that you have is you take the unit that you've got, drop the pressure down to about 40 pounds, and siljet the inside of it for a couple of seconds, dry it off, and then you take your, your silane coupling agent as if you're doing a veneer and place that inside, let that dry, fill up the crown with your, your, your common resin cement, because that's the point. We want a resin cement. If it's a zirconia or aluminum crown, you have to use a self-cure. You cannot use a dual cure. I mean, you could get away with a dual cure, but you want something that's really going to set through it. You're not going to use something. I'm not like curing on the right because I expect to get through zirconia. I'm like curing because in my practice what I do is I like to tack the margins so that if the patient swallows or moves, at least I know if I have a dual cure cement or the ability of a dual cure cement, what I'm doing is tacking it in place and allowing the auto cure, the self-curing feature of it, to cure right through it. As far as cycles, the bottom line is in the beginning you may have less fractures, but after 300,000 cycles for the most part, there really isn't any difference between any of the materials that we have when we're using a uh, resin cement and we're tribochemically curing it because the weakest part is going to be the ceramic that's attached to the, the substructure. On the right hand side is a lithium disilicate. Anything in that 360 to 400 uh, range is going to be something that's either pressed or pressed is meaning that we melt it down and we use a lost wax technique or we've milled it and that's where the CAD comes in compared to some of the other materials that you see out there. And we know what the other materials, we've all used composite, we've all used porcelain jackets, so you know how strong it is. Now you just take it and you double or quadruple the amount of strength that you have in that unit. Our patients are asking for it. Our patients want all ceramic. That doesn't mean on tooth number 15 or tooth number 18, I'm going to put a shoulder finish line and do a, uh, and do a porcelain jacket or I'm going to do a, a lithium disilicate crown. I can sort of explain to the patient that the only person seeing it when they pull their cheek back to their ear is themselves. It's between us. So you may want to go with PFMs in the back, but if you have a short retentive crown, a lot of times you're going to get tooth number 15 
that's only a millimeter or two sticking up above the gingiva. You may want to get a long bevel or a ferrule effect to sort of grab onto it, and what's going to happen is you want to bond to that tooth with the resin cement, and now you have the ability to sort of maximize. I don't want do-overs. I, I want to do everything the first time as if it's going to last forever. So there's no downside to just taking a, co a couple of seconds, blasting the inside of a PFM even on tooth number 15 or, or something in the back of the mouth to give it 110%, give it your best shot the first time and every time. PFMs work. I mean, it's a ceramic structure. You can get some really incredible aesthetics. If you've got short retentive crowns, you can literally tribochemically treat them. The middle slide is illustrating two stumps. On the right side, you could use a translucent cement. You can use a really aesthetic material. The problem you've got is you've got a really dark shade. And you can sort of mix and match your cements and try to do it that way. But on the, the middle slide, you're probably going to go with a lithium disilicate, which can mask out a lot of different materials, or go with zirconium. And in the zirconium, you're not going to use a, a Bruxer-type crown in the front of the mouth. It's not going to be 100% zirconium. In this case, you're going to ask your technician that I want a zirconium framework to block out that stump shade, to give you the color that you want. It's like putting a metal coping over that stump. And now what they can do is they can either press, which is probably not what they're going to do in the central, but they're going to bake good old-fashioned felspathic porcelain right on top of that. And because it's an anterior central incisor, it's going to last just like a porcelain jacket would. But you have the advantage now of you have something that is a little bit more accurate and more stable than a porcelain jacket, which is the weakest link is straight through it, where you've got a good solid framework with zirconium underneath it. And that pretty much sums up today. Are there any questions? The question, the question is, is the strength of a zirconia crown equivalent to a PFM? Historically, PFMs were the only option that we had when we wanted to have a truly ceramic unit. And with, with zirconia, now a Bruxer crown, why would you do a Bruxer crown? You're going to do a Bruxer crown because the indication really is for gold crown. The only advantage to a true 100% zirconia crown is because you only need a half a millimeter of occlusal reduction. So if you've got a space issue and aesthetics aren't really critical, you can eliminate gold and you can eliminate metal by doing a Bruxer crown. You're, you're, you're limited in your finish line in that you have to use a shoulder or a chamfer. But when it comes to occlusal reduction, you theoretically only need a half a millimeter if it's 100% zirconia because you're looking at a strength of about 100, uh, 1,000 megapascals. Uh, However, the weakest part, if you're looking for aesthetics, you've got different options. If I, was, if I were doing a central, like that, that really dark root, the root stump that you saw, I would ask for a zirconia core, and then I would use felspathic porcelain or a type of really translucent porcelain or aesthetic porcelain to go on top, and it's going to have the exact same uh, wear resistance and fracture resistance as a porcelain jacket because that's the weakest link. It's between 90 and 150, and that's what a porcelain jacket is, between 90 and 150. A Bruxer is 1,000. A, a P PFM is also anything that you're baking porcelain. You're taking powder and liquid like we did in dental school, and you put it in your glazing in your, in your oven to sort of get it to, to form into a glass. All the glasses that we're comfortable with, the early glasses, are between 90 and 110. So you get the strength of zirconia in a sense because it's 1,000, but you're not using that strength because the weakest link is whatever's the softer or, or most more brittle material, and if we're baking felspathic porcelain on top of it, it's going to be between 90 and 110. In the bicuspid area, what they'll do now, is, and in some molar areas, to give it a better look, they take the zirconia framework, which looks just like a metal framework that we would try in, and then they can wax it up, and they'll literally press, meaning that they melt it down. It's a lost wax technique where they wax up the contour, they burn the wax off, and they take a plunger, and they push. That's why it's called, it's like an injection molding technique, and they'll replace it with a lithium disilicate or a lucite-reinforced ceramic, which are in the 360 to 400 megapascal range. So it's a lot stronger than a porcelain jacket, but you're not getting the aesthetics of a felspathic porcelain. For, li for any ceramic-based material that your laboratory technician or you can literally take hydrofluoric acid and use it outside the mouth, the risk in, in using hydrofluoric acid on porcelain is that you have to get it into the mouth. And I've had issues with, with associates in the past dropping it on their blouse, uh, getting it on their face, and things like that, you don't want to be in that position. So I don't feel comfortable in my practice placing hydrofluoric acid in the mouth. But when it comes to any of the silicate base, meaning porcelain jackets, the uh, lucite reinforced or lithium disilicate, you can etch them outside the mouth. Then you're going to use your silane coupling agent that everybody's feel, that's been using in the past on a porcelain veneer to sort of allow that chemical bond now between any of the resins to, to the ceramic itself. Porcelain fused to metal, the downside to porcelain fused to metal is you have to opaque the metal, okay? That's, and, you, and you have a, 
they're great restorations. And you get that black metal line. The downside to porcelain fused to metal is long term. Strength wise, they're identical in the sense that because anytime you're the weakest link is going to be the falspathic porcelain. The, the downside to a porcelain fused to metal is that you have to opaque that metal, where if you're using zirconia, you're starting with a white framework versus a black framework. So you don't have to really opaque out as much. Um, and the other thing is that black line. If you use a zirconia framework, 10 years later, when they get a little bit of gingival recession, they're not going to go like this and say, why do I have a black line? I just found it last night, and it's been there all along. Uh, so you're not going to have that. You can have a white line. Zirconia, because it's CAD CAM technology, has to be a shoulder or a chamfer. Because the, the way it works is you've got, short, you've got diamonds and robotic arms milling this thing, and you can't mill it to a feather edge. But when you think about it, laboratories now, even though the manufacturers will tell you, with pressed materials, you're not supposed to have a feather edge. But because you're literally using a wax up, and you're melting it and pressing it down, a lot of them now are getting some really beautiful results with feathers. My concern is that, like we all know, when we do a PFM, we try to cover the collar. Once in a while, when we seat it down, a little piece of it breaks off. And that may happen as well. I haven't done that many press where I used a feather edge. I'm just starting to get at this. I only started researching this about six months ago. Up until then, I was doing porcelain jackets and uh, PFMs. And what I did after doing my homework is I went to a friend of mine, a colleague, about a half hour from my office, said, I want to learn how to use your E4D machine because I do occasionally get an indication, like on 11 or a really long perianally involved tooth where I want really super gingival margins and I really want a margin that you can't perceive or isn't going to have that black line that they're going to complain about. That's a good question. Any other questions? That's, that's interesting because when, when George and I prepared for this about lithium disilicate and toxicity, it's out there, okay? And I'm an evidence-based dentist. I, I, was, I went to the ADA meeting in Chicago this past summer. Unfortunately, it's an in vitro cytological study that he quotes and presents. And you cannot really go by animal studies. You can't go by in vitro models. Clinically, I don't see a reaction. When I'm doing a, an Emax crown, a CAD Emax crown, which is lithium disilicate, I'm not seeing a hyperplastic reaction. I'm not seeing inflammation relating to that crown. So in the human model, it may not be something that we can apply to. And it's a big problem in dentistry today where we have manufacturers. A lot of the slides that I showed you are based on manufacturers, like the study on wear resistance. Why is lithium disilicate kinder to a tooth than some of the other materials, like enamel against enamel. It's harder than enamel. You would think it's going to wear a tooth out faster than something like, like pure gold. So some of the information we get from manufacturers you can't trust. Some of the studies that we see, like cytotoxicity to a metal like lithium disilicate, we have to analyze the study, look at how many people are there, and whether or not, now, if, we, if you're familiar with evidence-based dentistry, the best evidence we have is where we do a meta-analysis or a systematic review where we're pooling thousands of patients together and coming to a conclusion. Yet when we have an in vitro study, we know historically animal models are horrible, in vitro models or lab models are really terrible, and podium speakers are just as bad. So um, you've got to keep that in mind uh, when, when you're looking at the studies. Yes, that's a good question. We're out of time. Oh.